All right, good. You see, um, Zoom is much harder than mathematics that I'm going to um, talk about. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting if I remember um, one of my previous keynotes at Yao, um, there I talked about uh, category theory. Now I'm going to talk um, about calculus. Um, and I'm going to kind of try to um, do some remedial teaching um, showing you everything that you um, should have learned um, maybe in middle school or high school about calculus. Um, and I'll also explain why that is important. So I don't know about folks here, but uh, since COVID started, I'm having um, a lot of weird dreams. And a lot of these dreams actually um, involve um, math. In fact, last night I had one of those weird dreams where I was in the building um, lost. I was looking for the lecture hall, but I was completely lost. Then I kind of stumbled in via the back door, the door fell over, and then I entered the lecture room um, and then turned out that I had my wrong notebook with the exercises from the week before, um, and it was all a disaster. Um, and these dreams keep coming. And it's always like, you know, something to do with math and something where I kind of lost my way and forgot things or even got like didn't even realize that there were classes going on. So I thought, OK, if these dreams are haunting me, maybe I should do some math um, in the real world uh, to stop them. But as I said, like yesterday, I had another of these dreams, so it didn't help for me, but maybe it helps for you. Um, and if you're not dreaming about math yet, maybe after this talk you will. And um, so I'm sharing the joy of nightmares about mathematics and um, spreading that through the world. Um, a while back, um, I talked about software 2.0. And software 2.0 is where um, we are using machine learning, where we're using data to learn models instead of writing code from scratch. Um, and software 2.0 is composed out of probabilistic and differentiable programming. And I'll explain a little bit about these styles of programming. Um, but the big difference between uh, software 1.0 and software 2.0 is that software 1.0, so that's the software that most of us are cur currently writing, um, is all about discrete um, values. Um, so we're talking about strings, buttons, windows, um, arrays, all discrete. And then maybe we have some floating point values. Uh, but in software 2.0, everything is continuous. So everything is floating point or real numbers. Um, in software 1.0, everything is exact. If we have a Boolean, it's true or false. Where in software 2.0, we're, we're approximating things. So there is a, a lot of uh, probabilities involved. And if we look at software 1.0, the way we reason about programs is using algebra. Um, if you look at databases, there it's most obvious. We're using the relational algebra. Um, and in software 2.0, we're using calculus. Calculus uh, like we learned in high school. Now, the question is, do, does this mean that we have to all retrain? Do we have to kind of throw away all our knowledge about the past um, and relearn and retrain to um, be effective software engineers in this new world. And what I'm showing, hopefully I can give you some hope, namely that's not the case. Um, and, and Nikolai is going to talk to you about C++ move semantics. Um, I am going to state that uh, what I'm going to show you today is much, much easier than C++ move semantics. Um, so um, I think that uh, that should give you some confidence. All right, let's uh, zoom in a little bit. Differentiable programming. Well, obviously, it's called differentiable programming. So that is um, has all to do with differentiation. If we look in Wikipedia what differentiation means, um, you see that while well, you kind of like you know you define the derivative of a function f prime. 
um, using a limit, a limit of h going to zero, and no need to understand all of this. I just want to again point that this limit thing, you might remember that from um, your math classes, or, or you might not, because if you zoom into uh, limits, you get all these complicated things, uh, epsilon, delta, and like lots and lots of quantifiers, um, and really, really complicated um, math. If we look at probabilistic programming, uh, that all has to do with integration. And the reason for that is if you have a probability density function, um, then you have to take the integral to take a probability. So you, 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 you compute the probability that the value here is um, the probability that the value is between A and B by taking uh, the integral um, between A and B of the density function. And if you look at how um, integrals are defined, you, you can, like, you know, the integral is defined as the area under the curve. And how do you compute that? Well, by slicing up that curve into really, really tiny pieces. And again, there's lots of limits and epsilons and deltas involved. And that's, again, like, you know, like more nightmarish math. But what I'm telling you is you don't have to worry. And the way we're going to solve that is by realizing that real numbers are just abstract data types. This is just something that mathematicians dreamt up. Um, and uh, in fact, it took them you know, a long time, maybe um, centuries, to come up with a good definition of the real numbers. Um, and the real numbers that we're mostly learning about today are counter real numbers, and we will kind of denote them with this um, double struck R. And we, like, of course, floating point numbers are an approximation of real numbers that don't have all these nice properties. But the real thing to remember here is that real numbers are just an, an abstract data type that satisfies certain properties. And just like in programming, there are many ways to get like define things. So we can define other kinds of numbers. And the, um, the version of real numbers that we are going to use here are, I will call them the lover real numbers. So these are invented by uh, William Lover is a category theorist. Um, and you can forget uh, most of this, except um, you should look at axiom four here. And axiom four says that like, you know, for every function, um, there is a unique value such that like, you know, this f of d equals f of zero plus d times a. In the definition here of these numbers, the notion of um, derivative is built in. Um, and the special thing about these um, numbers, these lower real numbers, is that it has a set of values d um, of values such that d squared equals zero. And this is the, the, the numbers that we're going to deal with. And so keep in mind, um, I'll use the um, bold phase R for the larva real. So these are reals that have these infinitesimals, values such that their square is zero. And then the, the double stroke R are the real numbers that we all learned about in high school. Now, I promise you to make things simple, but it's not so simple. And what um, is happening here is that if you take the real numbers and you define um, in the real numbers the set of values of numbers such that their square equals zero, um, then you can prove that zero equals one. Um, so the fact of having these infinitesimal values whose square equals zero and the, the regular real numbers leads to um, a paradox. That if you kind of assume both, then you can prove that um, zero equals one. Um, and the proof is here, no need to understand it, but just keep in mind that with our traditional real numbers, if we can, like, you know, take um, infinitesimals, um, then we can prove um, that zero equals one. Um, and conversely, um, if we 
um, allow case distinction. So if we allow functions that use conditionals um, and we use the lava real numbers, then we can also prove that zero equals one. So that's also got like um, a contradiction. So we get contradictions in, in both ways. Um, and the um, actual solution that the folks, the category theorists use is they say, oh, let's get, like avoid uh, the law of the excluded middle. Let's use intuition, intuitionistic logic. Um, but what we'll do here is we'll kind of go for a slightly simpler approach. Um, and so instead of um, eliminating the, the um, law of excluded middle and go to topos theory and all got really complicated math, what we'll do is we'll do something simpler. All right. And what we'll do is we will study dual numbers. And dual numbers are like the fruit flies here of the math. And we're using, we're, we're going to study uh, these dual numbers such that we can understand these other um, um, real numbers uh, better. And most of the theorems and most of the concepts that we'll develop will carry over automatically. So what's a dual number? Well, a dual number um, is a pair of numbers, a plus a epsilon. Um, where epsilon square equals zero. So we're taking the, the idea of uh, a value whose square equals zero. And what we're doing is we're building pairs of two numbers where one, the first part is just a regular number. And the second part is uh, one of those infinitesimal values. And the nice thing about these dual numbers, by the way, they were invented um, like 200 years ago or well, slightly less than 200 years ago. So this is really, really old. Um, but the nice thing is that if you take a regular function and you lift them, you overload them to work on dual numbers, then this function um, automatically computes the derivative. So um, that's written down here, f of a plus a epsilon. Um, is f of a plus f accent f prime of a epsilon. So that's a kind of dual numbers property. So just like for these lava reals, um, dual numbers have differentiation kind of like built into them. Now the question is, how can we prove this? Well, one thing we could do is use Taylor expansion, but that's um, cheating because that assumes that we already know derivative, what differ, derivatives are, that we know what Taylor expansion is, and we don't know. So this is just way too complicated. We can also say, let's get, like replace limits by these infinitesimal values. That would be great because now, instead of reasoning about rates of change, calculus, like a, a value going down to zero, we're, we just have something with symbols. So we get algebra. Um, and this is also a little bit uh, problematic because if you look at the a formula at the bottom there, we're dividing by a epsilon, and that's a problem. We cannot divide by infinitesimals because if we do that, um, we can prove that these infinitesimals, infinitesimals are zero, and that's exactly not what we want. But if we put on our programming um, glasses, if you look at these dual numbers, um, then they have structural equality. So a dual number a plus a epsilon equals b plus b epsilon if a equals b and a equals b. So that's just structural equality. Um, if we drop the first term and only look at the infinitesimal part, uh, then this thing is called microcancellation. So we can prove that two numbers, two um, of these infinitesimal numbers are equal if their real parts are equal. Um, but really, uh, microcancellation is a fancy name for structural equality. So these dual numbers are just pair, pairs of numbers that have structural equality. So nothing complicated going on. But what's really nice is that by just doing arithmetic on these dual numbers, um, we can prove a lot of theorems about um, uh, derivatives. For example, we can uh, show by a straightforward calculation that the derivative of the inverse of a function 
is one divided by the derivative of the function applied to the inverse of the function. Um, and there's no need to really understand this right now, but I really want you to look at this um, derivation here and just see that it's all just symbol pushing, right? There's nothing magic going on. I'm just applying um, simple arithmetic, uh, the fact that if a function has an inverse that like, you know, it's the composition of the function with it inverse is the identity um, and that's all. Similarly, we can derive um, the sum rule, the product rule, the quotient rule, all the rules about derivatives that you know um, from high school that were kind of like, you know, normally proved using limits. And you can now just show them with, without anything, just simple, simple um, manipulation, simple algebra. Um, if we're using some even older math, we can um, also show the derivatives of um, the uh, sine and cosine. Um, and in order to do that, we first have to um, guess or define what the sine and cosine, how we extend those, how we overload them over infinitesimals, um, because they're only defined on the real numbers now. So we have to get like overload them over infinitesimals. And we can, if we define the sine of epsilon as epsilon and the cosine of epsilon as one, then we can again, with very simple calculation, we can show that the derivative of sine is cosine and the derivative of cosine is minus this uh, sine. And don't feel intimidated by these derivations. Uh, it's really um, all straightforward calculation. That's the kind of thing that I want to get across. And that's why I kind of spelled these out in very, very, very tiny detail. But you see, there's no magic here. There's never epsilon delta. There's no limits. It's really simple algebra. I can. It's like functional programming. I've I've turned calculus into functional programming. Another nice thing here is that we can take this definition of dual numbers and turn that straightforward into code. As I said, like a dual number is a pair of values. I'm using here Kotlin. Um, so I define uh, the dual number class here as a pair of um, values um, of a real part and an infinitesimal part. I define structural equality on it. Um, and then the definition of the operators directly follows the, um, the rules that I just shown. And just by that, um, we can now um, find the derivative of any function by just overloading um, instead of over um, floating point numbers, uh, we um, overload on dual numbers. And here I'm doing something really, really bad. I have defined um, uh, the real numbers as a type alias for, for floating point numbers, which is of course uh, not true, but I think it looks um, a little bit uh, nicer um, at least on the slide, but I'm not pretending, of course, that the real numbers are X or floating point numbers are actually um, the, the real numbers here. Now, in order to use um, this kind of differentiation um, for deep learning, um, we have to, to change it a little bit and I won't go into the details here, but in some sense, that's pretty straightforward. Um, you, you apply continuation passing uh, transformation over this forward AD, and then you get backwards AD, and backwards AD is what is used to train neural nets with backpropagation. So backpropagation is nothing more than dual numbers um, with um, continuation passing and transformation applied to it. And so that's a kind of separate implementation detail, which means that we can continue to, to study these dual numbers and everything then will apply to um, whatever implementation of uh, differentiation, whether it's forward or backwards, it will just follow from here. 
the next step what we're going to do is we're going to take this um, definition of dual numbers and we're going to put that in point free style. And this will take um, about five steps and I'll go through all these steps, you know, or six steps because like, I start counting with zero, but I'm going to talk you through all these steps. And the nice thing is that we then get a quite different formulation of these dual numbers. Um, but that will be a formulation that will um, show a very, very powerful way to define things. Um, and that, in some sense, is the real meat of this talk, is to show you how to define properties as um, universal objects um, by um, a unique uniqueness property. Um, and from that, we'll also be able to define a way to do integration. And plus, it's just fun. Um, if you're a Haskell programmer or a functional programmer, it's always fun to write things into point free style and to impress your friends and family and to take something that's very readable, like the thing that's you know up on the top there in red, and turn it into something that's unreadable and that's highlighted in yellow. That's the goal of um, making things point free, right? It's to impress um, how how good you can obfuscate a program. And the big trick that we're using is something called scholarization. Uh, again, it's a, a very old technique. Um, more than 150 years old um, that um, allows you to kind of replace existential quantifiers by universal quantifiers. And the um, idea is there in the bottom left. Um, if you have a formula for all x, there exists a y such that p x of y, what you can do is instead of um, having that y, you can say, well, that y somehow depends on x. That x essentially quantified y depends on x. So if I just express that by having a function f of x that will conjure up that y for me, now I can just replace that existential quantifier because the y disappears. Um, and, and then if we only have or universal quantifiers left, we can all drop them and we get a very simple formula under the assumption that every variable there is um, universally quantified. Let's look at a couple of examples here. Um, and um, let's focus here on the um, rightmost column. Um, there's the formula for all x, there exists exactly one y such that p x of y. And if we scholomize that, um, it becomes the formula on the bottom right, p x comma y, if and only if y equals f of x. Um, so you, you can imagine um, that, I think so at least, that the formula on the bottom right is more concise and easier than the formula at the top. The formula at the top has like two quantifiers, has this weird quantifier with an, with an exclamation mark, exists exactly once, um, where the formula at the bottom just says, like, you know, that p x of y, if and only if y equals f of x. Um, and here's an example. Um, if, a concrete example, if a function is bijective, if you look that up on Wikipedia, it says that that's the case if for all b uh, there exists exactly one a such that f of a equals b. If we um, scholomize that, now it becomes really simple. It says f of a equals b if and only if a equals the inverse of f applied to b. And you see here the kind of really nice symmetry which is a symmetry that you expect when you're talking about something that's bijective. Um, and that symmetry is not there in the formula with all the quantifiers. So here, I think everybody has to admit that this looks way, way neater. All right, so let's kind of like, you know, take step zero and we are going to, to write our original dual numbers formula using quantifiers. Um, so for all pairs a comma a, 
there exists a unique dual number such that um, f of a plus a epsilon equals b plus b a epsilon. And uh, that's our, our dual numbers property. And applying scolarization to that, we get the formula here on the bottom with this um, um, and, um, mutual implication. And again, what we're doing here is just purely mechanical. And um, at this point, I shut off my brain. I don't even interpret these formulas. I'm just doing symbol manipulation, right? Somebody has given me a recipe. Here's a formula. This is how you apply scolarization. And that's what I'm doing. That's what I love to do because my brain is the size of a peanut. So I don't like, I don't want to, I, I can manipulate symbols. Um, and if I don't have to understand what they mean, that's great because now I can just blindly calculate. It's like doing a long division, right? You, you learn how to do long division, and then in the end, you can check if it makes sense. But while you're doing the long division, you don't have to think. You just can't, like, follow an algorithm. And that's what I'm going to do here. We're just following an algorithm. No need to understand anything. We're just pushing symbols. So we're applying the formula here for scolarization. We get this formula below. And now we see that this formula here on the left, um, F A plus A epsilon equals B plus B A epsilon. We're going to turn that into variable free form. And in order to do that, we're introducing this helper function alpha. Um, and again, it's not necessary to get, like really understand what this function alpha does. Um, and I can write it even in point-free style using curry and uncurry and sectioning and, and composition. Um, but literally all we're doing is we're, we're using a helper function such that we can write this equation um, in, in point-free style. And then we're doing the same on the right-hand side where we have this conjunction and we're replacing that with another function here that, that combines F and G and applies both of them to the argument. This allows us to, to eliminate the conjunction and write that in um, something that looks already a little bit more obscure. So if we apply this to both sides, now a lot of the variables have gone, especially the infinitesimals have gone, and we are arriving at a slightly shorter formula. And we're going to, what we see here, that there's still this kind of like pair B comma B on the right side and on the left side. So that's what we're going to eliminate next. Um, in order to do that, we have to introduce some more helper functions. Um, and if we get like introduce those helper functions, which are beta and gamma, now we can uh, rewrite that red function into the uh, yellow function below. Um, and at this point, I'm pretty sure everybody is kind of completely lost. Uh, which is actually good because I want you to lose your intuition about what differentiation is. We don't want to understand differentiation by looking at graphs and tangent lines across these graphs. I want, it's like I'm doing here like, you know, therapy on you. I'm going to destroy your understanding of derivatives and I'm going to rebuild a new understanding of derivatives that is completely free of intuition. That is a new way of looking at derivatives that's purely algebraic, that's purely symbol manipulation. So this is goodness. So the more confused you are, the more you are like becoming a new you where you forget all the bad stuff that you have been taught in the past and where you um, learn all the great new stuff uh, that I'm going to put in your head. All right, so applying this um, here, um, what we're going to do now is we're going to um, make this even shorter. We're going to eliminate that A by um, taking A equals zero. Um, and now we can simplify this formula and we get um, the, uh, the thing here um, in the bottom left. And I don't know if you remember um, the definition of isomorphism that we've shown, but this really here is um, the equation for an isomorphism. All right. Um, so what we are seeing here is that the pair of real numbers 
r comma r and a function of a infinitesimal to the dual numbers are isomorphic. Um, and so this is in some sense pretty surprising, right? We started out with these dual numbers. We, we um, massaged them into variable free form and what we discovered is that really there was an isomorphism hidden um, down there. And the isomorphism is between the types of these various functions. Um, but the nice thing of having this, uh, the formula in this form is that we can get free theorems out of this. So here's what we're going to do. Or first of all, let's kind of like, you know, take a step where we are. So we started with um, a definition of uh, derivatives um, defined using dual numbers. Um, I did a lot of hand waving and confusing steps to um, arrive at this formula here. And what we're going to do now is we're taking that formula um, as an axiom. So we're taking this um, isomorphism as an axiom and there's no intuition required. In fact, I would say everybody has lost completely the intuition about this. And that's exactly what I want. I don't want you to have any intuition. I just want you to say, this is a, an axiom that, that, these, um, that these functions are an isomorphism. And then we can define differentiation using this complicated formula using gamma and alphas. Um, and they, look at this. This is really what we're doing. Is we're, we're, it's very much like functional programming, right? We have defined some properties of our functions, and now we can define a new function in terms of existing functions for which we know certain properties and calculate from there. So let's uh, do that. Um, and to do that, I just want to get, like, you know, show you a couple of properties that we can get for free. So one thing that we can do is we can take the top line f equals alpha b comma b, and we can substitute that f into the bottom right. You see, because there's an f equals something. Well, I can take that definition of f and substitute it in the bottom. The other thing that I can do is I can take the definition of the pair b comma b that is defined in the bottom, and I can substitute that in the top. So those are two things that I can do just like, you know, replacing equals by equals. That's what functional programmers do all the time. And then the third thing I can do is I can use the fact that this thing is uniquely defined. So that's a third um, um, formula manipulation can do, that I can do. So if we um, substitute the bottom one and the top one, we get this. If we substitute the, the, the bottom one and the top one, sorry, reverse, we get this. Um, and then if we use the uniqueness, we get this. Um, and again, no need to understand all this because it's just purely like syntax manipulation. But what you should look here is that now we get here three theorems for free, right? Just by defining um, this axiom, and instantiating the axiom in various ways, we get these three uh, theorems for free. So the bottom one um, is familiar because that says that, that we have structural equality, right? Alpha A comma A equals alpha B comma B if alpha equals, if, if A equals B and A equals B. So that's structural equality. Um, the, um, the beta and the gamma are like projections. So if I have beta of alpha b comma b, it gives me the first um, um, part. And if I do gamma on alpha b comma b, it gives me the second one. So that's also pretty simple, right? It's just projection. Um, and then the top one shows that we can define any function. We can write any function that you give us, and we can write that in terms of alpha, beta, and gamma. But that's another kind of like nice property, or you can look at it as some kind of fixed point property, right? Like this function is kind of like recursive, or but really the way to look at this is that you give me a function, an arbitrary function, and I can just write it in terms of alpha and beta and gamma, and then all these rules apply. All right, now the nice thing is that based on these definitions, I can 
compute what beta and gamma are, and I find the same definitions as that I used before. Um, and the other thing is that I can show using these rules that our um, dual numbers property still holds. So what I've done is I've taken um, the dual numbers property, I've turned that into point freestyle, and now I've, and from there I, I got like a couple of free theorems. Now I'm using these theorems and I can show again that that is equivalent to our original dual numbers property. So the circle is round. Now this is a, is a trick that you can use, um, you can reuse. And um, so if you define your um, abstraction F using this equivalent, so B equals F of A, if and only if uh, P of A and B, and then P of A comma B could be an isomorphism like here or something else. Um, and now we can kind of like, you know, substitute the left-hand side and the right-hand side. We can substitute the right-hand side and the left-hand side. Um, you get all these free theorems and everything just becomes symbol pushing. So this way of defining a, a, a property um, is really, really useful. In fact, um, in Squiggle, which is a style of functional programming, and this is the mostly widely used trick. And in category theory, this is a very, very um, often used trick. It's defining things as a universal property. Um, so it's really something that mathematicians and functional programmers have been doing for forever. Um, and that's revealed here by taking this dual number properties and writing that in point freestyle. Now let's relate this again to um, the, um, the law of our real numbers, uh, because we said we're going to look at dual numbers, which are slightly simpler. If you look at the type of alpha that we derived, it takes two real numbers and maps it to a function from infinitesimals to dual numbers. But if you look at the lover real numbers, there is much more recursive. We're taking a pair of these kind of like special real numbers and we're getting a function also from infinitesimals. They use the capital delta for that to these kind of like lover real numbers. So this is a, a much more complicated um, equation. Um, and that's why just li limiting ourselves to dual numbers is much easier. And it doesn't lead to a lot of these contradictions. But dual numbers are not powerful enough to do everything. Uh, for example, they cannot deal with, directly deal with functions with multiple variables. Um, and for that, we need to introduce a multiple um, different epsilons. Um, but what we can do is we can also show that we can now prove Taylor expansion. So Taylor expansion that we showed looked really mysterious. Um, and it, as I said, like it already assumed that we knew what derivatives were, um, but now um, we can um, derive this um, from first principles. But as I said, if you want to take um, higher order derivatives, you need multiple of these um, infinitesimal values. Um, in this case, if you want to take the third derivative, you need three of these infinitesimals. But again, like, you know, nothing here special is just stupid um, symbol pushing. Um, and then you can prove um, a Taylor expansion in general. And um, so something that looked really mysterious and really hard uh, becomes just simple symbol manipulation. Um, if you want to learn more about this, there's a really nice article from um, John Bell. He also has a, a, a book. Um, it's very thin. It's thinner than the book on C++ move semantics. Um, and then this book here is the kind of like the the real kind of like you know like hardcore um, version of all this. And literally, what I've shown you today so far is one page out of this book. So I've, I've taken one page out of that book and expanded that into, I don't know, like a, a 45 minute um, talk. I think um, it's like, you know, like, like Felina is going to show you how to read code. 
and reading math is also a special skill. And people write things down really, really compactly. And so you have to put a lot of work in there to expand it, to decompress it. Um, and what I've shown you here is, I'm not lying, is, is like, you know, like one paragraph in this book where it says, oh, this version here is the same as this version. Um, and we, what we have done is we've um, expanded on that. Um, if you want to take higher order derivatives, as I said, you need some kind of recursion. Um, there are kind of like plenty of papers that discuss this. This one is the most classical one by Jersey. Um, and you see here the, the type there on the top, diff of A is a recursive type that is diff of A on the right side. Uh, Connell Elliott has written um, a lot of papers about this as well, uh, same using recursion as well. And then the two godfathers of automatic differentiation are Perlmutter and Suskind. Um, and any paper that they have, um, you will see, um, will talk about um, automatic differentiation using these dual numbers and variations of this. Um, and again, here they also say that we need to have like multiple of these uh, infinitesimals. Now, what's, what's interesting, and this will be my last slide, I'm, I'm going to maybe get, like go one minute over. And um, there's a lot of people that um, historically, and that's the reason that we learn all about epsilons and delta in school, is if you look at the early uh, folks that were doing calculus, they were using infinitesimals, but they were not like, not formalized well. And then this um, here, Bishop Berkeley um, said like, this is crazy. These infinitesimals are, are stupid. Um, and that's when the, the regular mathematicians dropped them. Um, and we, we got um, the, all the limit stuff. Um, but with um, what I've shown you, we can make these infin infinitesimals formal again. But if you don't like them, you don't even need them. Because we can give you another axiom, um, and this is the axiom here, um, and this axiom looks even weirder. And again, like you know, don't ask me how you come up with this, but you know, you can define this equivalence, and now you can define derivatives um, in this way. Um, on the right here, you can show that um, this actually works um, if you assume the other system, but if you assume this as an axiom and you use the free theorems, now you can compute all the rules for derivatives without any infinitesimals. So that's in some sense really nice. You, you, you define an axiom, you define what differentiation is, and now you can compute all your derivatives without using infinitesimals. The problem with this version is that there's no obvious way to implement what we saw before is you can implement them easily. All right, I'm running out of time. I wanted to show you um, also what, um, what integration is. So I'll leave you with this slide. Um, and integration, again, you can define it axiomatically again. Um, for all f, there's a unique uh, primitive, capital F, such that the derivative of capital F equals f and f, uh, capital F, f of 0 equals 0. Um, from that, you can get, like, you know, extend it to arbitrary intervals. Um, and if you scolomize this, you get this very, very simple axiom here. And from this one rule here, you can um, prove all the things that you learned in high school about uh, integrals. And so really, kind of like, you know, if, if your high school teacher would have shown you this one rule, uh, that's all you need to know to get, like, do all the integrals you ever want to do. Well, maybe not all the integrals, but most of the integrals you ever want to do. So given that we're over time, I want to leave it here. And then um, we have like lots of time to answer questions in the, um, in the chat. Um, to summarize, what I've showed you today is to take um, a way to define um, derivatives using dual numbers. I turned that using um, manipulations into point-free form. And 
point-free form, this is like, you know, what Haskell and functional programmers do for fun. What we ended up with was a, an axiom for um, differentiation where we um, said that this thing introduces an isomorphism. Now we could define differentiation in terms of the functions that we defined. And from that, we, can, uh, we could reconstruct everything we know about derivative from this um, one scolomized um, or point-free axiom. And we can do the same thing here for differentiation. And the beautiful thing here for me is that here, the, it has no intuition, right? It just tells you, like, you know, given a function, lowercase f, there exists a unique function, capital F. And that satisfies these properties. So it doesn't talk about limits. It doesn't talk about areas under the curve. It just gives me some properties of functions. And then using that, I can calculate and apply my regular functional programming skills. So I hope that I convinced you that you can turn calculus that talks about um, rates of change and everything into pure algebra if you formulate it in the right way using these axioms. And now, if you were so lucky to understand um, functional programming, then everything is now reduced to just um, the same kind of like things that you do when you do functional programming in Haskell or F Sharp or whatever your C Sharp, JavaScript, TypeScript, whatever your favorite Scala, your favorite Kotlin, your favorite functional programming language of the day. So that's it. Thank you very much.